Esther such a amazing book. And I was reading this week, and somebody said to the extent I wrote, I wrote down uh, at least what they were driving at um, and thinking about the book of Esther. Someone said, uh, God's mightiest forces in nature work silently every day. God's mightiest forces in nature work silently every day. Gravity. Gravity. The magnetic field. The pull of the moon on the tides of the oceans. The rotation of the earth. Good thing it doesn't creak, okay? Just silently. Silently. The evaporation and condensation of all the rains of the earth. The warmth of the sun giving life to all of God's creation. God's mightiest forces work silently every day. So it is that God silently works in our lives every day. In every person, in every event, in every prophecy of his word, God is at work. And it's silently so that we don't realize. We don't realize. We want to read this morning, chapter 1. And that's the, the story of Esther is that God's at work in everybody's lives, all the time, in every event, working everything together to his will. And it is mind-boggling, mind-boggling how the Lord does that. In Esther chapter 1, we want to read through and then back up and preach about Ahasuerus in Vashti this morning. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces. He ruled the whole world at his time. That in those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia, the media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and four score days. That's a half a year. Having a party for a half a year. When these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace, where were white, green, blue hangings, fastened with cords of fine linen, and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver, upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble, and they gave them drink and vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse from one another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law. None did compel, just trying to make everybody happy. For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Also Vashti the king made a feast for the women in the royal house which belongeth to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded the human, Bizda, Habona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king, with a royal crown, to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen, Vashti, refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Chamberlain. Therefore, 
was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. And the next unto him was Karshina, Shepha, Admatha, Tarshis, Merez, Marshina, and Memucan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face, which sat the first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen, Vashti, according to law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king of Hazarus by the chamberlains. Memucan answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king of Hazarus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. The king of Hazarus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen, Thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before king Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. So they also, the princes in New, uh, New Mucan, the Mucan, what he says, just get rid of her. And give her, give her estate, give it all away. And the saying, let's say in verse 20, and the king's decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great. All the wives shall give their husbands honor, both to great and small. And the saying pleased the king and the princes. And the king did according to the word of Mimucan. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province, according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, and every, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Wow! What a story. What a story. A Wednesday night we looked at, we went through this story, and we looked at uh, eight things that will not help a marriage. Actually, we had uh, probably a dozen or more, but we grouped some. They all began with P, and we grouped some together. But you see, as going through the story, uh, power, position, prestige, prosperity, a palace, partying, popularity, perfectionism, pleasure-seeking, pals, because the king had all these friends uh, giving him bad advice, uh, being pretty, best I was beautiful, being pretty, uh, having a world perspective, all these things didn't help, didn't help the marriage. And it was... The story is about a king, a king who ruled the world. He ruled the world, but he couldn't rule his home in his marriage. And the king who ruled the world but wrecked his marriage. He, you know, you can be a rich man uh, and be a poor husband. And you can be a, a success at work and a failure at home. That's what we see here displayed by King has an heiress, and you look at the story, how could a man uh, who had become world ruler, how could he ruin his marriage? Uh, what happened? Where did he go wrong? And pretty simple. We're going to go down through. We're going to look this morning at uh, broken scripture, broken marriage. We'll go, just go down through and think of uh, scripture verses that Ahasuerus broke. And if you want to ruin your marriage, just don't obey God's word. It's that simple. If you want to uh, heal and mend your marriage and have a happy marriage, all you got to do is obey God's word. Walk with the Lord. Sounds easy, right? 
uh, you better pray, pray for grace and strength and help and patience and, uh, and just lean on the Lord because we know that life isn't easy. But God helps us. God helps us. As we go through the story, uh, we see Ahasuerus broke God's word several different ways. And it was amazing that and we know that this is uh this isn't a Christian couple. This isn't these uh they're not believers, but even an unsaved couple that follows principles from God's word can have a lasting marriage. We know that. You've had you might have had neighbors uh that were married 50, 60 years that would never come to the Lord. You say, well, how can they do that without the Lord? Well, they did it with the Lord's principles. They did it with the Lord's principles. I heard years ago, uh, some basketball coach out there, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was a basketball coach, there's some coach that claimed to be a Christian, and he wrote a book, and in his book, uh, I remember I was listening uh, to him talking on the radio, I think while I was delivering newspapers, and he was saying that uh, when you study success in any area of life, it's got to follow God's principles. Even for the unsaved world, it's got to follow God's principles. God's uh, word upholds hard work. Hard work. Um, truthfulness. Uh, in a marriage, in a marriage, you know, you might see uh, uh, somebody's been married for many years, and like I said, they don't profess the Lord, but there's got to be forgiveness in that marriage. It's got to... Uh, be love, love in that marriage. And uh, if any ma marriage is going to last, it's got to be through the principles of God's word. And as you go down through the story, you see, I just picked out some verses where Ahasuerus broke God's word. And then we're just evaluating, evaluating the story, evaluating the story from our uh, knowledge of God's word. So... I've got 10 here, 10, so we just want to move right along. Number one, Ahasuerus broke Proverbs 16, 18. Turn to Proverbs 16, 18. Uh, as you're turning there, uh, that, that verse goes along with verse 4 when he, it says, uh, he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom. The riches of his glorious kingdom. In the honor of his excellent majesty. This guy was proud. He was proud. It's like Nebuchadnezzar. Remember how Nebuchadnezzar walked out and said, Look at all this great kingdom that I have done. Well, we know Proverbs 16 and verse 18. We all know it. That pride goeth before destruction in a haughty spirit. Before a fall. Verse 19 says, Better is it to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. And Ahasuerus uh, set himself up. Uh, he was so uh, proud. A uh, marriage, a marriage takes humility. Marriage takes humility. Marriage takes humbling yourself so many times. Uh, it might be you say all the time. You just have to keep saying, Lord, help me, and I need you. Anybody going into marriage? Anybody going into it? Look at uh, look at First Peter. First Peter chapter 5. This is a special admonition to pastors in uh, Ephesians, First uh, Peter chapter 5, to elders, to pastors. Anybody going in the pastorate? God wants them to be clothed with humility. Um, doesn't mean we always are, or pastors always are. Uh, we need to pray for God to help us. Um, and... Chapter 5 and verse 5 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, 
be clothed with humility. You know, that bride puts on the beautiful wedding gown and comes down the aisle and uh, so, so beautiful. And the, the groom dresses up like probably maybe he's never dressed up so nice before. You know what's more and more important is to be clothed with humility. You've got to have that going into marriage, and you've got to have that to continue. And you've got to keep uh, asking God for help. It says, Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Pride starts rising up in the marriage, and God's resistance, that the brakes start, the brakes start being applied. It just doesn't work. God says, humble yourselves, therefore under the mighty hand of God. All right, God, I don't know how to handle this situation. I just need you. Give me patience. Uh, give me understanding. You direct my way, you direct my path. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. First of all, Ahasuerus, he broke Proverbs 16, 18. Secondly, another passage of scripture I thought that he clearly broke. Look at Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. The Lord says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Well, this whole party was for self, to glorify self. It was all vanity of vanities. It was a put on. It was a show. And it wasn't for the glory of God, where we know God's word says, uh, where it says, uh, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Uh, every decision in a marriage, in a Christian marriage, definitely in a Christian marriage, should be, well, we want to honor God. We want to please God in this. So, Lord, help us in this decision. Well, Ahasuerus, it was, uh, it was a vain show. This was for vain glory. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes, Young couple, uh, young man, young woman might actually go into marriage just because I got, I got the man that, you know, I got the best, I got the best man. And, wow, well, because you better feel that way. You better, you better, you better make the best choice uh, through God's direction. But if you're looking at, wow, you know, I really look good. Ah, uh, beware, beware. I, uh, when I went to college, there was actually a um, man that had graduated probably three or four years ahead of me that was then teaching at the college and doing an excellent job. Just a young man starting out teaching college classes, that's quite a task to take on. And he was teaching Bible classes. I, I had a couple of his classes, really enjoyed his classes. And then the buzz around campus, buzz around campus. Oh, he's dating so-and-so. She graduates this year. I said, he's dating her? And my thought was, she's so arrogant. And she was uh, just, you know, 
uh, Miss Perfect on campus, but you could just that air, that air. I, uh, in th back in those days, they had assigned seating at college. You know, I, these, these days, we don't, we just don't make the kids do too much. We just were more, more permissive days. But in those days, they had a seating, assigned seating at dinner. So you had to sit, or they wrote it in the, anyway, uh, I sat at a table with this girl. And I just thought, she's not spiritually minded. She's stuck on herself. I thought, what is this nice guy dating that girl for? Well, I think it was Vainglory. He's the great, you know, professor on, on campus, and she's the, uh, what it, just uh, uh, perfect, and, and, and they Anyway, they got married. I moved, I graduated a little bit later, came up to Maine, got word through the grapevine. You hear that their marriage broke up. And she's already with someone else. And there's no, there's no, it's not looking like any way gonna get back together. Uh, and just a heartache. Uh, the heart break through that, and no young lady should ever go into marriage just because, just because of selfish reasons for vain glory. No young man should ever go into marriage just for uh, vain reasons. It's it's all for the glory of God. Am I going to marry this person because? We are going to glorify God together. We're going to praise God together. We're going to live for God together. Because that's what marriage is all about in God's eyes. is serving Him together. So, you want a broken marriage, you just break God's Word in different areas. Because God, we know, is always merciful. You can always say, Oh, I realize, I realize I was doing this wrong. I realize I was failing God in this area, and the Lord will forgive and help. But we see Ahasuerus, he broke Proverbs 16, 18. He broke Philippians 2, 3. He broke, well, let's look at down the passage here. Back to, go back to Esther chapter 1. Verse 10, verse 10 says, On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he broke Proverbs 23, 31. What's that? Turn over to Proverbs 23, 31. God's word says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, don't look at alcoholic wine. Don't, don't even look at it, God says. Do not look at it. At last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. You just see that serpent striking, sinking its teeth into a Hazarus so that he starts talking nonsense making stupid decisions, rash, harsh decisions, uh, alcohol. I read a quote this week uh, from Stone, Stonewall Jackson. Stonewall Jackson. He said, I am more afraid of king alcohol than all the bullets of the enemy. More afraid of king alcohol than all the bullets of the enemy. And he would refuse drink. Um, heard a little illustration that if you knew there were uh, two railroad tracks, two railroad tracks, on one railroad track, they have crashes and fatalities all the time. Uh, train derails, goes off the side of the mountain, crashes into the, 
the, the river and people die and people drown. The other railroad track is has this perfect safety. Just goes right along. Nice. And your son's going to ride on one of those tracks. Which track are you going to tell him to ride on? Uh, no brainer, no brainer, the safe track. Well, that's the two pass. I, uh, abstinence from alcohol or alcohol. That's, it's that easy, it's that choice. Not only does it affect you know, normal safety, but how many marriages, how many marriages? I think of uh, uh, my aunt and uncle, and they were just people-loving people. And they would have parties, just like uh, the king and queen here. They were always having, they, if there was a family reunion, it was at their house. And you'd go there, and it would be uh, just, they love people. Yeah, when you go, everybody knew they loved people. Uh, but my uncle was a drinker. And after 35 years of marriage, my aunt couldn't, it, couldn't take it anymore. And the marriage ended. Uh, Hazarus made the uh, mistake here. He looked on the wine when he shouldn't have, and he broke Proverbs 23, 31. It's pretty simple, pretty simple. You want to break your marriage and just break Scripture. Don't obey the principles of God's Word. Number four, number four. It goes right along with verse 11 in our text where uh, Hazarus commands to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the royal crown to show here is a vain show again. It's all about vain show. The party was about vain show. This is all about vain show. To show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. He broke Ephesians 5.25. Spot. Turn to Ephesians 5. You know this. You know this. But let's look at it. Ephesians 5, 25. Which says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Wasn't showing any love to his wife when he made this rash, uh, evil request. Definitely wasn't showing any love. You know, you read books, commentaries on Esther, and you know, the big question comes up, should Vashti have obeyed the king? Well, that's not the question to ask. The question, and somebody even said, I was reading, and somebody even said, well, what she should have done was she should have dressed up really modestly and came out and just, you know, stood there. I, I'm modest, and I came at your commandment. But she knew the intent was for them to look on her beauty. She didn't want to have any part of that. Any part of that, and you can't blame her. And really, if you want, you don't want to go the hype that well, what you know uh, uh, was Vashti at fault. You don't want to go to the when we know we know that Ahasuerus was at fault. We know that this was wrong for him to do. We know, as the head of the home, supposed to be the head of the home, this wasn't showing love. I mean, any man that loves his wife, he wants to protect her from any kind of scene like this. You know, any man with red blood flowing through him is like, uh, you look at my wife, you better not be looking at my wife. Not, not just any husband. I, I, uh, 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 my wife tells a story that when she worked at McDonald's way back before we were married, when she was going 
to call. She worked at McDonald's. And one of the men she was working with, actually it was the boss, the, the crew captain or whatever they call him, uh, made some comment to her. And the comment got back to her dad. And you, some of you remember my father-in-law, who was just a uh, uh, meek and lowly guy. But he went into McDonald's and grabbed that man by the shirt collar and, and took him and said, if you ever talk about my daughter again that way, then uh, you'll be hearing from me. Because he loved his daughter. What kind of man is going to flaunt his wife like that? Uh, a man should be concerned that his wife be modest. Uh, just on a side note, because Corey, uh, Corey was teaching on modesty in, in Sunday school this morning. I just, uh, on a side note is, I was watching a documentary on tanks. Pretty interesting. In the, it was, go, anyway, uh, I'm watching, it starts out with World War I when they started building them, and it came to the Korean War. And I'm watching, and, and there's these women running across the battlefield. This is what the Korean War, was that like 1950? Uh, running across the battlefield with their military guns, they're all dressed, and they're running across, and, and there's smoke everywhere, and you hear the guns going. They were wearing skirts. You know, it wasn't. You check your history books, you read. It wasn't until TV became popular. You know, we're all against propaganda. Uh, we follow different political news and we say, oh, that's propaganda. I don't, I, isn't that ridiculous? I don't believe that. That's propaganda. That's propaganda. You know, it was propaganda. It's been propaganda that the church has swallowed. Because God says, God says in his word to exalt femininity in women. Exalt femininity in women. It's not just modesty. And so here, I was like, those women are running across the battlefield in skirts. Like, wow. Well, you get Reminisce magazine. I like Reminisce magazine. I like reminiscing. Uh, what amazes me now is you get Reminisce magazine, and they have stories like about the 60s, like that's old times. How's that old times? I thought it was like the 20s and 30s. Those were the old times. Time is uh, flying. But you notice that the school kids, you know, you get, you, you go back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and you see uh, any pictures of uh, uh, city streets or uh, whatever you're looking at. And the ladies were wearing dresses until TV hit. TV hit. And started changing things, changing things. All to say that the king here, the king here, uh, should have been concerned about protecting his wife, and that's love. That's called love. Uh, if you love your daughter or daughters, you want to teach them modesty, femininity, teach them that, uh, how you said, being a girl, that God created them that way. It is wonderful if God created you a girl. You got boys, you teach them, God created you a man, be a man, be masculine, stick out your chest, you know, stand strong, tall. Um, that's God's way. He loves, he created both, and he loves it. Back to our text here is that we see as a Harris definitely broke, husbands love your wives. Then, look in verse 12. 
So he calls her out to show her, but verse 12, the queen refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Uh-oh. Broke God's word again. He broke God's word again. That's no big deal, though. Oh, I get angry. You know, I just have a problem with temper. I get angry sometimes. But she ought to understand that. I talked to a man one time, uh, having troubles in his marriage, and that was his attitude. Like, yeah, I get mad sometimes, but, you know, I get over it. Yeah, but you just hurt her so bad. You just hurt her so bad. You just put a scar on her. Uh, you know, screaming at her, calling her names, and then, oh, it's over now. Yeah, maybe over for you, but not you hurt her so bad. And so we know that the principle here, the uh, well, we'll say I wrote down he broke uh, Ephesians four thirty one. He broke Ephesians four thirty one. What does Ephesians four thirty one say? He should have been begging her forgiveness, you know. You may struggle with your temper and lose it, uh, but then you beg forgiveness. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Next Bible verse he broke. Turn to Psalm, this is number six. If you're taking notes. He broke Psalm 146. What is Psalm 146? And verse 3. Psalm 146 and verse 3. You might be thinking of a bunch more Bible principles he broke. Um, but Psalm 146, verse 3. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. The next Bible verse he broke was, he goes to his princes and says, and he says, to them, what do you think I should do? Well, the Bible does say there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors, but this was an issue that he was already Clearly, it wasn't her problem. He was the one that stirred this problem up. He was the one being unloving, unkind, uh, uh, drinking, and, and he's the problem. He ought to be going to God and asking forgiveness, and Vashti, and asking forgiveness. But he goes to his princes, and they give him advice, uh, you can turn over to Psalm 118. God reiterates that principle in Psalm 118, verse 9, says it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Any man that offends his wife and... Uh, you know, is angry with her and and treats her wrongfully and then goes to the buddies at work and says, uh, what do you think I should do about her? Ah, uh, he's not thinking right. God says here, Psalm 118, verse 9, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Verse 8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Number seven, number seven, another scripture he broke. Turn to Romans chapter 12. You break God's word, you're running the risk of breaking your marriage unless you ask for God's forgiveness and your, your spouse's forgiveness and, and uh, God's mercy. You ever, you ever uh, had a, uh, 
relative or a loved one or a neighbor, and you say, that marriage isn't going to last if they keep doing that. That is wrong. That's not, that's not going by the Bible. That marriage is they're breaking God's word. And then a few years later, it happens. Uh, you can't keep breaking God's word and getting away with it. In Romans chapter 12, in verse 19, God's word says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. You're supposed to be so good to your enemies, but you must supposed to be really good to your wife or your husband. If thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Up to verse 14 it says, uh, Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Verse 17 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Well, what is Ahasuerus' attitude? Well, she did this to me. What do we do to her? Ah, uh, bad reasoning. You just never want to you want to bless and curse not. Somebody in the marriage gets angry, and they say, uh, well, you, uh, and you say, sorry. Soft answer turneth away wrath. A soft answer turneth away. Grievous words stir up anger. Then we know, we know, number eight, we know he broke Matthew 18, 21, 22. What is Matthew 18? Well, you probably say, I wondered when you were going to get to that one. Matthew 18. Oh, Matthew 18. 21, 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him till seven times? Then Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seventy. What the Lord is saying is, you just keep forgiving. You just keep forgiving. You never stop forgiving. You don't, uh, husbands, love your wives, be not bitter against him. You just keep forgiving. Um, why? You just keep forgiving. That's God's principle. you got to keep forgiving. You never lose that attitude, that spirit. Then, I believe, we, we just mentioned two more here quickly. Turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. As you turn there, I read a little historical thing about has heiress in his his temper, his temper. The story said, history says, uh, whether it's true or not, the Lord can tell us when we get, but history said that he lost a fleet of his ships in some battle uh, on the ocean. So he took a whip, and he was so angry, he took a whip, he went down to the shore and he was beating on the water. That's how smart that guy was. Second Timothy, where are you? Second Timothy, chapter 2. How does this fit into the story? Verse 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endurance. What a wimp this king. This king rules the world. And he can't have his wife stand up against him one time. Well, I would say throughout marriage, uh, you know, marriage, you're going to have those conflicts many times. Things are going to happen many times. Just going to throw in the towel and quit. Uh, Proverbs 24.10 says, 
If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Thy strength is small. You think uh, uh, some marriages that have uh, just, oh, we're not compatible. Uh, we're, we just don't get along, whatever. And then you think uh, uh, some men that have, like a, a kid I went to high school with, um, I've mentioned him before. His wife got Lou Gehrig's disease, and uh, he took care of her, did everything for her for 17 years before she passed away, and uh, you know was faithful to his vows and you know committed and loved his wife uh, when she couldn't do anything. And then you have some guy. Well, she doesn't wait on me like. I, I expect her to. Uh, don't be a wimp. Wait on her. This is, this is about love. It's not about you getting served. Wait on her. Help her. Lastly, he broke. He broke. Proverbs 26. Turn, what is this? Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26 in verse 20 says, Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tailbearer, the strife ceaseth. As coals are to burn in cold, and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. They go, these, he calls his princes together. You know, they have this conference, and then Mimukin stands up and says, Oh, this is going to destroy the kingdom. This is going to be such a huge problem. Blah, blah, blah. We've got to do this. Sounds like liberals today taking some little offense, uh, uh, some stupid little thing and making it a national issue. They bring this big thing out. This is going to... And all it would have taken was is that King Ahasuerus, when it happened, said, I'll talk to her later. I'll tell her how much I love her and respect that she uh, didn't want to flaunt her body like that. And I'll say I'm sorry and just don't talk about this. That would have been easy. Uh, you break scripture, you break, you'll break your marriage. And there's so many other scriptures that we could think of in, in so many different stories, in so many different situations, but we will stop.